You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniele Fribrancini. Hello, Richard. Uh, Giro designer, course designer, head honcho for our Giro, which gets underway on Saturday, Daniel. Not just not just a course designer, not just some faceless functionary. I'm also <laughs> the race director. Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Someone's getting a bit big for their boots, aren't they, uh, Lionel? Yeah, someone's upset me today. <laughs> well, maybe we'll elaborate on that in a future episode. Oh, my goodness me. Wow. Someone's um, jumped the gun as far as the Giro is concerned. Oh, this oh is, Giro. This is... I, I don't know if we're getting back, Lionel. What someone do you think? started the someone someone started the prologue on the Friday, while everyone else, while all the other teams were still, you know, collecting their bags at the airport. Well, um, we we should be going to Hungary this week, as with many other people in the cycling world, for the start of the Giro d'Italia. We are not, however, we are beginning our daily coverage of our Giro on Saturday and. We've all been working pretty hard, haven't we? Um, obviously, Daniel's been working the hardest uh, as race director. Um, but you and I, Lionel, have been interviewing people and collecting lots of great material for the next three weeks. And cooking as well. I've been, I've been busy as a bee in the kitchen making Italian-themed meals. So... And and interviewing people from the world of cycling as well. I mean, you know, let's... let's not, not with your mouth full, I hope. No, no. No, it's going to be well. It's going to be a a three week journey through the the history and culture of the Giro and Italy itself, isn't it, Daniel? That's the idea. An, an, an acoustic love letter, I think we're calling it, aren't we? Acoustic love letter. Uh, we'll, we'll be telling stories. There are many elements to this um, this three week uh, bonanza. But the, the, the food you mentioned. Lionel, there'll be a wine element, there'll be a riding element as well, but we'll also be telling stories, um, recent and old, about the Giro. And we've done, I mean, among the in- interviewees, we've got Cadell Evans, Tom de Moulin, Chris Froome, uh, Andy Hampston and his win in 1988, uh, Jorgen Leth, the Danish filmmaker, um, interviewed him the other day. You, you two have been uh, interviewing lots of people as well, haven't you? Do you want to mention a few names? The more sort of left field names in my case, um, as is as is my want. Uh, Ivan Quaranta, remember him? Um, Richie Port, of course. Uh, Luca Guercilena, my former coach, famously. Um, a, a, a shadowy figure who was in the headlines a couple of years ago and um, became a very controversial figure since disappeared a little bit from public view. But there's a connection between him and well, the first three stages of our Giro and Hungary. What about you, Nathan? What about me? Well, um, I really enjoyed having uh, a, a simulated lunch with Max Chiandri last week, which uh, will be one of the longer form interviews that will go out. Um, Derby born, Tuscan raised Max Chiandri, and uh, we'll find out about his Anglo Italian roots and, uh, well, one step of separation from Max Chiandri to Robert De Niro. I wonder if people can work out how that comes about. But uh, yeah, the the Giro, our Giro, will also look it in detail at Mario Cipollini, uh, Gianni Bugno's 1990 uh, Giro d'Italia win when he led from start to finish, and of course went well. Italy went football crazy that summer, didn't it? But uh, Gianni Bugno won the Giro um, and uh, I think was the first rider since Eddie Merckx in 73 to wear the pink jersey from start to finish. And of course, that 73 Giro, as you say, Richard, was the subject of Jürgen Leth film, The Stars and the Water Carriers, which, uh, well, I watched this morning and will be ready to revise our um, Barry Norman impressions for a bit of a film review on that. Thanks. Well, well, we'll cover a bit more of this in the course of this episode. Uh, we're going to hear from Matt White, the Mitchell Scott sports director as well. We'll hear a bit from Tom de Moulin as well and how he's recovered from his injury and, and how he's finding the current situation. Larry Warbass again with his uh, his dispatch from lockdown and some news about uh, Larry Warbass and Connor Dunn and their adventure from a couple of years ago and a special treat 
for friends of the podcast. We'll have Francois Thomaso's song as well. But in a moment, we're going to hear from Marco Pinotti, head of performance at CCC and former rider. Um, Marco was on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he lives in Bergamo, of course, which was one of the places very badly hit by the coronavirus crisis. Now, we're um, working with Stacey Snyder, the ceramicist again this year. She has made some beautiful mugs and cappuccino cups. They will go on sale on Saturday. A first batch will go on sale on Saturday. And once again, they'll raise money for a good cause. And in this case, we decided to ask Marco to... Uh, to suggest a good cause and he suggested a cycling school in Cheney not far from Bergamo um, and well here's his rationale for that uh, so I came up with the idea of, of helping this uh, uh, cycling school it's really the real name Scuola Ciclismo Cheney first of all because it's uh, right in the middle of the area most affected by the coronavirus back since the beginning, it's in uh, Valle Seriana, and uh, then because I I never raced for this, or never been directly involved with with them, but uh, but the majority of people people I've talked to, they told me in mean, the last year this uh, club, okay, it's because it's a club, and then uh, they raise kids from six uh, to eighteen or twenty years old, they give them the possibility to race. It's one of the the club that uh, give you know, keep the, some some values in order. Like uh, the first uh, school is more important than uh, you know the, the bike racing, and then they they try to give the the highest amount of of, of uh, young riders the possibility to race, regardless of their talent or their possibility. And you you mentioned that the 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 you know you're you're very supportive of the people running it. You feel that they are. Um... You know they're good people, and that they've obviously set up a very worthwhile initiative. Yeah, I mean it's it's all uh, the people the, uh, the 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 people who who run the team are all uh, volunteer, and it's uh, it's I'm also by by I know I know the what is the vice president and, and his father was the president, so it's it's a lot of volunteer and it's all all done by donation of the small uh, industries of the valley which are suffering as well uh, the problem of, of the lockdown because this valley is very industrial. And um, on the other side is also one of the... This used to be a valley, Valle Seriana, where uh, Savoldelli grew up, Guerini grew up, but the team they grew up to uh, are all disappearing because of the... You no, know, it turned out from... Uh, from uh, the, 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 the area has been more and more industrial. And, and so it's it's more and more dangerous to go by bike and there are not many clubs left and this is one of the few left and one that uh, gives the possibility to to young people to, to go by bike it's a very nice valley it's a very nice ride to ride the bike actually here's some famous climb uh, Selvino or uh, you know up to Passo Presolana and and, and I think you you got in touch with them didn't you with this uh, suggestion or this proposal What what was their reaction I mean, they were initially the just to show you how these people humble these people are. They said, "Yeah, but uh, uh, we don't know how much money you can raise, but it's better maybe to give to people who really need, like uh, doctors or nurses right now are under a big pressure." That was, you know, the proposal was really at the beginning of March. So we hear news. Uh, the the only noise we could hear out of the road was uh, the ambulances. So the the, the president there. The first thing he mentioned me, you know, I mean, it's better if you give money to these people. Mm. So this, this show again, you know, the, the moral values of the, of the people running the team. Well, that was Marco Pinotti explaining uh, that the, the mugs and cappuccino cups uh, made by Stacey Snyder will will benefit that cycling school. It sounds like a, a great cause and uh, we'll tell you a bit more about them over the course of the next few weeks. Um, in terms of when the uh, Stacy stuff will go on sale, it will be on Saturday. Um, it'll be sold uh, through her uh, Etsy, Etsy page, Etsy page, and uh, that's Etsy.com, E-T-S-Y.com, forward slash shop, forward slash Snyder Ceramics. Um, she'll also update her website with information about when they're on sale 
That's uh, st- stacysnyder.com, S-T-A-C-Y-S-N-Y-D-E-R.com. We've already mentioned wine, and uh, there'll be wine available to listen to the podcast as well if they want to buy some wine, and some of the proceeds from that will also go to the Cycling School in Cheney. Uh, I think you've got a bit more information on that, Daniel? Well, I think you've got more information on the wine than any of us, Rich, at this point. Um, almost a week out from the start of the race. I think um, you know, you've you treated yourself to a bit of a sneak preview. Um, <laughs> the just, wine... It's oxygenating is, nicely. Yes, yes. Well, in addition to our Giro, so that's our fictional Giro route, fictional sort of redacted Giro route, It's um, there are, there are some, some similarities with what would have been the 2020 Giro route. Um, parallel to that, we've also come up with a, a wine route, um, a Percorso dei Vini, and um, I've been working with Greg Anderson from Divine Cellars, which is an independent wine merchant in London, um, specialised in biodynamic wine, organic wine. And um, Greg and I have come up with a, a selection um, representing the Giro route, our Giro route. And um, those wines are going to be available to buy. Um, Greg, I think, can deliver to pretty much anyone in the south of England, but um, might even be able to go further afield than that. And um, we've got a Selezione R Giro, the cycling podcast, and we've also got a Baby Giro section. So um, there's a 12 bottle option and a six bottle option, and we'll be tasting the wines and we'll be commenting on them um, in, uh, well, certainly in Richard's case, in his inimitable style stand by during, for that. The, during the episodes. That's if Richard has any of the wine left by then. You're listening to the Cycling Podcast. Brought to you by iWaka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWaka. If you run a business, find out more at iWaka.co.uk. I W O C A.co.uk. Our title sponsor is iWaka and they will be supporting us on our virtual journey around Italy over the next three weeks. And well, they're in a position to support lots of small businesses at the moment. They can lend between a thousand and two hundred thousand pounds and applications can take only a few minutes. And they promise a fast and fair decision once an application has been made. To find out more about iWaka and particularly how they are confronting the challenges during this coronavirus crisis, Obviously, lots of small businesses are finding times very tough. Let's hear from iWaka's Chief Operating Officer. Hi, I'm Seema and I'm the Chief Operations Officer at iWaka. At iWaka, I am responsible for our UK operations team. So it's a team of around 60 people who talk to our customers every day and help to serve them. And I also am responsible for our people team. So our team that does our um, recruitment and HR and looks after our office when we have an office. We're all home working at the moment. So I work a lens to small businesses in the UK and in Germany. The businesses that we lend to, to give you some idea, they're hairdressers, plumbers, car dealers. Uh, it's a real wide, diverse range of customers that, that we serve. The, the switch to home working was a relatively straightforward one for us. All of our systems are cloud-based. All of our teams have laptops. Um, so we were able to make that switch relatively pain-free. Uh, but yeah, there's been a huge impact on our customers um, and in turn, a huge impact on our business and also on on, on our lenders. So yeah, we're all in this together. There have been some really big shifts that we've had to make but look our you know our mission has always been to be there to help our small business our small businesses to thrive and you know in terms of um how it's changed you know about kind of four weeks ago you know we were focused very much on um helping to kind of issue new funding to customers uh, and more recently there's been a much bigger focus on helping our existing existing customers who have loans and to be able to repay those loans in a way that's affordable for them when their circumstances have changed significantly as a result of the crisis. Um, One of the things we're doing at the moment is applying for um, accreditation from the British Business Bank so that we can help to distribute some of the uh, government funding that is being provided by the government that Rishi Sunak announced um, a few weeks ago. Uh, And we know the banks are 
have been struggling a little bit to get that money out fast enough. But you know, getting money quickly to small businesses that really need it is really like the bread and butter for iwaka that's the that's the reason we exist so uh, our application is in and um yeah we're hoping to be accredited soon and we're already in the process of building a product so that we'll be able to do that as soon as the government say we can so um yeah it's 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 a uh, there's a lot going on at iwaka now we're still super busy um but yeah certainly had to change a lot and some of the things that we've been working on to adapt in the current the current situation that we that we find ourselves in if iwaka sounds like the perfect fit for your small business go to iwaka.co.uk that's i w o c a.co.uk well we'll tell you a little bit more about our giro um later on in the episode including the route uh, but this morning I spoke to Matt White, the Mitchelton Scott sports director, somebody who for me is synonymous with the, the Giro d'Italia. And you'll hear um, from him again throughout our our, uh, our Giro coverage, as you would if the Giro was actually on, no doubt, um, on, on various topics. But I also asked him about how things are at the moment with his team, Mitchelton Scott, and, and the, the possibility of a revised calendar uh, later in the year with the the Tour de France coming at the end of August, followed by the Giro and the Vuelta. Um, and uh, asked him about that uh, and a little bit about uh, how some of his riders are, are managing in this situation at the moment. What well, Part of the, the magic of the Giro is maybe that it's the first Grand Tour of the year. If this revised calendar comes off, um, what, would it, what would it be like going to the Giro in October after the Tour de France? Look, if the proposed calendar comes off, it'll be very interesting because with that window, of what my prediction is, if that with the window between the tour and I don't see many, I don't see many riders saying, especially this year, or saying, saying I, I, I won't ride the Tour de France because I'll wait for the Giro. No. So, um, whereas you know, people do that. People do. People don't ride the Tour de France to ride the Giro on the World Tour. I think the combination, if, if those two Grand Tours do overlap, the Giro and the Vuelta, I think the only combination you'll see guys doing is maybe the Tour and the Vuelta. Mm. And uh, I think you'll see a different type of rider maybe at the Giro. I, I, and also, it'll be on what they do with the, with the first three stages. Uh, highly likely won't be starting in Hungary. So are, are they going to be three sprint stages? Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I, I think... Yeah, you'll have a different guy winning the Giro than probably would have won. Um, probably would have won if it, 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 it had been in this normal calendar slot. How? I mean, how do you pick teams for these races as well? I mean, given the lack of racing and and that that factor of the Giro, um, you know, not the Giro not being a, a building block to anything else, just an end in itself. I mean, how how do you go about selecting teams for these races? Look, I would think that most teams would be in the same situation that that they will stack their tour teams. So, and look, most teams do already take their take their best team to the tour. But yeah, sometimes you can't, especially you've got younger guys or whatever. Sometimes you can't take a lot of guys from the Giro to the tour. So, not not the best field doesn't always go to the Tour de France because you know, look at look at some of the leaders. They they'll go to the Giro and they won't ride the tour. Whereas this year, I think every team will have their GC guy at the tour. And I think it'll be more, more the younger riders and maybe the up and coming GC guys you'll see battling out for the for the Giro win. Look on, on a team like Ineos where they've got you know a lot of leaders, maybe you still might see a Carapaz uh, leading the team there. Mm. Maybe because they have so much depth. Where does Carapaz fit into the Ineos Tour de France team? Mm. So you- um, but most teams haven't got the luxury of having six Grand Tour winners in their loss in their roster. <laughs> So, so uh, look, I would think like you know Jumbo Visma, they were get, they will send all three leaders to the Giro. Uh, Any else will send you know, their best possible team to the Tour. Uh, but you know, like I said before, maybe there's a, maybe there's too much talent there that they have to send one or two guys to the Giro. So that that's and and same with us. You know, Simon Yates was originally doing the uh, was originally doing the Giro. Highly likely he won't be now. Uh, he, he'll probably be focusing on the Tour. So. Yeah, that will be interesting. Yeah, so the Giro could almost be like the Vuelta in, in, in normal well, years. Yeah, and also also be interesting too is, um, you know, when you look at the, the, the sprinters, you know, like a, normally a Caleb Ewan, a Viviani, a Gaviria, they do two weeks of the Giro and then go to the Tour. 
Now, all of those guys, I would think, will be at the Tour. Now, they're not going to pull out of the Tour de France to go to the Giro. So you could see a quite weak or a very different sprint field at the Giro as well. Um, you might not see your top flight guys at the Giro in the sprint in the sprinters because there's just no time to recover. So it'd be real, real interesting. Or they might go because you know, two weeks is okay recovery, but it's okay recovery if you're only riding 10 days. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ifs and whatevers, and uh, we'll see uh, as we get closer to the day, especially especially when we see you know, th- there's been a leaked calendar, but that's only the World Tour races. There's a lot of small races that have got to be laid in there as well. Yeah. How, how optimistic are you that, that we'll, we'll see any racing this year? I mean, you were saying your kids aren't aren't due back at school till September. Um, no, no. Look, I have, I'm going to leave leave the how they're going to get it done up to the experts and the governments because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are going to decide if we race, not the UCI. Um, yeah, it's I don't understand how they're going to move 3,000 people around uh, hotels daily uh, in a safe way. That's, I don't know. I don't know. A lot's going to lots going to depend on how this how small this virus is mm. a month out or six weeks out. You know, it, things are moving pretty good at the moment, especially in Spain and Spain and Italy. I think they're down in the hundreds. It might sound a lot, but they're they're in the hundreds of deaths a day at the moment. So it's re- really scaling down, and the con- the the contamination levels are are really going really well. So I think in the next three to four weeks, the virus is. It's going to be very minimal here, but the, the big problem is governments. I think governments aren't going to be so open to opening borders, mm. and especially people from you know, overseas. When, you know, America is still going to be the epicenter of this virus for a while to come. Mm. I, I can't see too many at, at the way we stand at the moment. A lot of uh, governments aren't going to allow just freedom of movement once this does it clear clear up. Um, you know, you're trying to put as much structure in place, are you, for the riders to? For, for their heads as much as their bodies maybe at the moment yeah just 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 to stay connected you know we've we've got you know, we've got some we've got some young guys in there who've been locked in their apartment for seven weeks so you know imagine being a 23 year old like Callum Scotson who's in an apartment on his own for seven weeks in Girona mm, yeah you know like you, and you're allowed to leave you're allowed to leave to go shopping like he probably hasn't he probably hasn't had a decent conversation with someone face to face for two months so it's probably been quite lonely. So, you know, we, Monday morning we did the, we've been doing the team the team ride, and that's been on Zoom. So people have been having a chat and mucking around. They do one lap easy, and then then they go they muck around on the second lap. And that was um, that's that staff have been jumping on there as well. So that's the men's team, the women's team, and the staff. That's been every Monday. Then the Ruby racing was on last week. We had the Swift stuff on this week, and then they've been having two Saturday Sunday. There's been structured rides uh, for the team. And then a midweek one. So there's been something to keep everyone entertained. And I think that the guys in Girona will probably be scaling down a bit now because those guys uh, have been allowed out in the road as of today. Right. Yeah. Um, the guys in Andorra, f-ing hell, the, the, the Andorran government have made this. It's only, well, at the moment it's for a week. So those guys have got, they're allowed to go on one road in Andorra. So they've got to drive their car to the starting point. They can't ride there. They've got it's it's a, it's out and back. To, it's got two climbs in a valley road. Right. But they've got to go between eight o'clock and eleven and ten o'clock, and they've got to have a follow car with a medical kit in it. It's like it, there's this wow. list of rules. Yeah, yeah. So most of our guys are just going to go. Ah, they they can't. Well, we, they haven't got one. That, there isn't a team car up there. So I would actually know if they could. They, they 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 can use a normal car, but if they've got a if they've got a girlfriend or partner who wants to follow them for two hours on the on the <laughs> road out and back, but uh, the Andorran government because there's only forty oh yeah because there's there's only forty eight pros living in Andorra. So of the forty eight pros, they've split, split them up into two groups, and so uh, one group can train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The other group Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. <sighs> wow. Wow. So that's it's They're, most of those yeah. guys are just going to are going to blow it off for this week. Whereas the the guys who are living in Spain and they're they're and Italy, they're they're into it. They can go for they're they're on the road now. So that was Matt White, the sports director, head sports director, Mitchell and Scott, um, talking about the 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 proposed revised calendar, um, and and obviously adding uh, the point that whether these races happen is very much uh, in question and and will ultimately be decided by. The authorities rather than uh, the UCI or ASO or RCS but they've got to work on the basis that they will happen at the moment and 
plan for those races. And that, that raises lots of very interesting uh, questions and challenges, I suppose, not least the fact that the Giro uh, will come after the Tour de France. And, and I thought what he said was really interesting about how, how that would affect the field. And, you know, someone like Simon Yates, who was going to go to the Giro and try to win it this year, w- would not now do that in this new scenario. Um, and then also, you know, he was talking about the, the challenges that some of his riders have uh, living alone in some cases, and the, the riders in Andorra. Um, he also mentioned, I mean, a couple of things about, you know, some of his riders are living at altitude. Um, Simon and Simon Yates and Lucas Hamilton are at 2,000 metres. Esteban Chavez is at 2,700 metres. And he says it gives them up to a 12% disadvantage in the in the e-racing. Um, he also said that he'd been keeping an eye on what some other riders and other teams are doing and that he's noticed quite a few riders basically just doing what they do on the road on their indoor trainers, 25-hour weeks. And he said that none of his riders are doing that. They seem to be very much kind of uh, maintaining uh, their fitness rather than training really hard because the goal is so uncertain at the moment. The The target that they're aiming for, nobody really knows where, where it is for sure. So, um, yeah, some interesting uh, comments as always there from Matt White, I thought. Yeah, Rich, the... The calendar discussion and the calendar question um, could be quite a fascinating one. Obviously, nothing's been confirmed yet, but the people I've spoken to, and I'm sure you guys have spoken to, and and certainly um, several of the reports that have come out in, in Spain and Italy are pretty unanimous that um, the, the Giro is going to take place between the 3rd and the 25th of October, and the Vuelta will be cut to 18 days. I think it's 18 Um, And it will be between 20th of October and the 8th of November. So that's a a week earlier than we thought it might be. Um, There was talk a couple of weeks ago about the Vuelta finishing in late or mid to late November. Um, But I suppose what it does and what Matt uh, hinted at there in the interview was it takes the the option of the Vuelta as a sort of um, kind of last chance saloon. I, I always used to compare it to that awful nightclub that um, when you would go out, particularly I went to university in London and there was a place called Ombres just off Oxford Street and at the start of the night everyone would be absolutely um, adamant that they would not end the night in Ombres and um, you know you would you would try you would try to catch the you'd be be out there you know drinking and trying to catch the eye of some lucky lady um, earlier in the evening and start to get quite despondent and start Good to get grief. quite start to get quite quite drunk and then by the end of the night everyone was piling into ombres and the Vuelta is a bit like that isn't it no one says at the start of the year I'm targeting the Vuelta or not many people do but you know a lot of people end up there um, but we're... does that mean then that if the Giro and the Vuelta are overlapping um, you know there'll be some people in ombres and there'll be uh, the people with some taste will be next door somewhere much nicer I- I- igloo and Alpe d'Huez <laughs> exactly <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But but we know now that if, if anyone really wants to do the the welter, uh, well the tour welter double, it's it's probably going to have to be sort of premeditated, and um, it's you know it can't be, it's impossible that someone can do the Giro and the Vuelta. Um, and you know, there's the other question of prestige. I know that at Mitchelton, you know, when there was discussion a few weeks ago about an 18-day Giro. Um, conversations were were had, or and, and I'm sure it wasn't just that team, but about you know did that diminish the Giro? If take Simon Yates for example, Simon Yates a couple of years ago looked certain to win a Giro d'Italia, or he looked very likely to win a Giro d'Italia, and he blew up on what was it the 19th day. So if you imagine Simon Yates winning an 18 day Grand Tour now in this um, in this very much sort of compromised season, um, would he then faced the, the the allegation, the the argument that oh well, you know he can do it over eighteen days, but not nineteen or not twenty one. So you, you know the the Vuelta is going to have to face up to that, isn't it? Um, and it's going to yeah, it, it, that might impact some riders' I mean, decisions. Yeah. We're used to seeing asterisks asterisk beside riders' names for Grand Tour wins, but this would be a slightly different one, I guess. I think the thing we have to bear in mind really is that the, the the calendar as written 
is is like the the most ambitious child's Christmas list. It seems to me, you know, put everything on there. You know, I want a scalectric set and a computer and a bike, um, and and really, it may well be that that we don't get everything that w- that we would like. Um, you know, we. we the, the, the fact of the matter is that we just don't know whether the calendar will be able to resume on the 1st of August, as, as everyone hopes it will. And um, we don't know whether professional cycling has really dug down into the detail of, of what is and isn't feasible logistically. And I think that it will come down to what the teams feel that they can, uh, what they can cope with. And the people that, that uh win the races will be the people who are are able to adjust to potentially plans changing you know right up to maybe what two three four weeks out from from something actually um happening i mean it it's impossible to um plan um on the basis of of a 100 percent certainty that any of these dates are going to hold so um it could be somebody could be targeting an event the tour de france starting at the end of august and then finding that that gets shifted back a month really it's going to be a case of um you know everybody just coming to the start line hoping for the best and really i think it will be more refreshing just to see some racing and 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 worrying about the kind of the whys and wherefores of who's doing what event and and whether they're in the the best form um you know that kind of that's a secondary discussion once we actually see some uh competition going on and i think that yeah we'll just have to have to wait and see um but i would i would say listening to matt white talking about uh, riders doing 25 hour weeks on the on the trainer the, you know, the possibility of being mentally burned out let alone physically burned out by the time some actual racing resumes is i would have thought would be higher if if somebody's hammering themselves away that, yeah, indoors that, that's kind of what he was suggesting and also why you know their team are really dialing it back in terms of the training um and certainly in terms of of ours um wh- i mean one rider who is hoping to race this year as they, as they all are, but knows what it's like to not race is Tom de Moulin, who we have interviewed for our, our Giro coverage. Um, let's hear a little bit from him now because he obviously had most of the last year out with uh, with injury, um, and I, I was just keen to find out how you know he is in terms of his fitness and form, and how he feels to be sidelined once again. How how are things now? You you know you've obviously uh, you had your injury problems last year. Um, does it does it? Nobody's racing at the moment, but does it play on your mind that that it's been a while since you did race? Is that is that something that you worry about at all? Um, not necessarily not necessarily worry about, it, but uh, yeah, it's sometimes uh, yeah, I, I doubt a little bit. Like yeah. And, how how is it going to be if I when I come back into the peloton? Uh, do I still know how how it how it works and do I still know how to fight for position and uh, stuff like that? You know, mm. um, about my physical condition, I'm not too worried. I mean, I know what I can do and then I know what I can do in the in training, and that's the same as any other year. So. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite confident about that, but it will definitely be strange to to just be in the cycling world again. Mm. I've been out of it for so long. Um, so, but yeah, anyway, nobody will have races for at least half a year. Uh, so actually we are, we will all be in the same position in, all, all in September or, start, or yeah. end of, end of August. So, yeah. yeah. Is it, is it, is it, easy to keep motivated when there's so much uncertainty do you do you find that difficult or 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 not no not really no 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 training i had it last year already and uh i had a lot of time last year to reflect on what i what i wanted what i what what my ambitions still were what what i love about the sport and what i don't like about the sport and about my job actually um and i had so many answers um <laughs> that uh, yeah i take that into this year i know what i want and i know what i where i want to be when this uh, whole corona crisis is over and uh yeah that's uh that's what that is what gets me up every morning and uh i'm still very motivated 
What What's harder? Is it being out long term with an injury or being sidelined like everybody else as we are at the moment? What What's tougher? The injury. When everybody else is still racing. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Everybody's in the same boat now, um, which is not nice. I mean, it's not a nice boat to be in uh, altogether, mm. but at least we're in this together. Um, and last year, I felt like... Yeah, I was the only, and it was actually true. Uh, I was the only one sitting in that uh, injury boat, mm. um, and that was definitely harder to accept at, at times. Mm. Great. Well, I hope we hope we see you racing and everybody else racing again soon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Fingers crossed. How how confident are you? It will be this year. I have really no idea. Mm. <laughs> I just really hope we can race at the end of the year. Um, in some way, um, maybe without uh, people on the side of the road, or maybe, yeah, we just need to do our best to, yeah, to find a way to still race, um, as long as it's not affecting uh, global health. Um, if we have, yeah, if we can find a way to to not affect or to not, yeah, yeah, put, put other people affect, in danger. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, then we should just race in, in some way. Mm. Um, and I hope that's going to be possible. But yeah, at the moment, nobody knows. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. Very grateful to them as ever. And if uh, you want to get 25% off any Science and Sport products, go to scienceandsport.com and use the code SISCP25. I've been munching away on their Go Energy Bakes, and uh, I even had a sneaky little uh, performance nitrate gel on our group ride on Sunday morning, Lionel. Did you indeed? Is that why well, you... Well, you might have noticed. You might have noticed the little spurt that followed that. You were, you were romping up Box Hill, weren't you? Virtual Box I Hill. I was. I actually was virtually romping up Virtual Box Hill mm. and uh, and doing so in the vicinity of Stephen Moon, the Chief Executive at Science and Sport, who joined us again on the ride. And I did spend a bit of time uh, trying to drop him, uh, right, trying to ride past him quite fast, but he kept coming back. So he must have been uh, taking even more of the performance <laughs> nitrates than me, I guess. He had two to your one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the energy bakes are great. They are little cakes, um, you know, that are a nice uh, substitute for energy bars. Um, do you wait? Got strawberry and lemon. Do you wait until you're actually supposed to have those, you personally, before you crack them open, <laughs> or do you? Oh God, we're still you, on the wine do you here. Wolf those down. This is, he's not going to let this go, is he? I mean, I think I, technically I did probably open these before I was supposed yeah, to. Shock, the energy that bakes. Shock me. Um, but you know they were sitting there, so tempting, a bit like the wine. Anyway, um, there was we heard from Tom de Moulin there. We'll hear more from him in our in our Giro coverage. But um, Daniel, there was a point you wanted to make about turbo training. Well, just you mentioned uh, that there are some riders who have been doing very intensive tra uh, training sessions on turbo trainers and a lot of hours on turbo trainer and. Um, I was listening to an Italian podcast the other day and Mario Cipollini was one of the guests and he mentioned and in fact went into quite a lot of detail about how he thought that that a lot of riders who are doing long hours on the turbo trainer will derive quite a big advantage from this at least in the short term because of the nature of the pedal stroke on turbo trainer um the the lack of sort of dead spot i think everyone who's ridden a turbo trainer um will will know what i'm talking about particularly you know when you're doing simulated climbs on a turbo trainer um and that the, the sort of the way the resistance is distributed across over the, the whole pedal stroke and yeah he thought that a lot of a lot of people would come out of this period if that's all they've been doing um going very very well particularly on climbs and um, obviously you know, we expect um, the the restrictions to have been relaxed in in most, if not all, countries for a, for a reasonable period of time before the actual racing on the road starts again. So maybe whatever advantage people are deriving will will no longer apply then. But you know, it's an interesting point. Do we not think would endurance not suffer as a you know it, it, condition is a 
you know, it's a it's a seesaw, isn't it? You get one bit of it right, and then the other bit starts to suffer, and then if you work on the endurance, then the you know the the top end starts to suffer. I mean, is that not the case? When, not if you're doing seven hour rides. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess. So with a seven hour turbo training ride, they're going to be able to do twelve hour road stages. Brilliant. The, it'd be like, I mean, it'd be like you, the early Giro's. The thing is, you you are you're pedaling the whole time, which you're not on the road, and. That in itself means that you know an hour to hour ride is probably worth more time. Um, it's equivalent to a longer ride on the road in in pure you know effort. I mean Matt White talked about this as well because um, he as well said that the, the thing about Turbo Trainer is you and and especially on some of these platforms you always go hard. You know you don't go you don't go on the Turbo Trainer and go easy. Whereas all his cycling the last few years has been pootling around at 120 150 watts and he said that his normal exercise is running and he hadn't been running for a while and he noticed when he went out running having spent the last few weeks on the turbo trainer that he was really fit so i think i think it does get you fitter ashley Mulman passio the ccc rider has spent six or seven weeks um obviously on her turbo trainer and went out at the weekend and rode her local climb rocca corba uh, and um, I'm trying to figure out whether she actually broke her best time or went very, very close. But the the long and short of it was that her form was certainly very, very good, having spent all that time on the turbo trainer. Little addendum to that: I just messaged Ashley Moulman Passio, and she did beat her previous time at Rocca Cora. But her previous uh, time as Queen of the Mountains was 3440. After six weeks or so on the turbo trainer, she did thirty one oh nine. So she absolutely hammered her previous time. One thing I think we can be fairly sure of, Rich, is that the physiologists and coaches um, watching who work well working for World Tour teams and, and other pro teams and, and watching their riders over this period in their their training on turbo trainers will be able to harvest an awful lot of interesting information um and they, they might well well information which might well inform the the way they train riders going forward um we might see some fairly significant and interesting um changes to the sort of received wisdom about training and how world tour riders should be training going forward just before we leave the subject of turbo trainers we should mention that our latest friend special shouldn't we which is a real treat for for anybody because it's uh, <laughs> it's a it's an interview with Daniel Freib introducing Daniel Freib and my goodness this this prompted or inspired a flurry of signups when people heard about this one really did we had a very busy weekend people are obviously keen to understand the enigma that is Daniel Freib I know you listened to it at the weekend Lionel I did did you really. <laughs> Yeah, I did. Yeah, listen to it all it? the way through. That's hot it. take? No, I, no comment. Hot take was um, I was surprised. At, well, you mentioned your VO2 max. I won't spoil it for people who. Uh, um, but I've only ever been cycling with you once, Daniel, and there wasn't there wasn't a great deal of evidence that you were you were <laughs> quite as talented on that particular. Yeah, day. I didn't think you got VO2 max. Well, I bonked, in, in didn't I, figures. line with you? Um, you did. You had to stop at a shop and buy chocolate bars to get the last 10 miles back to Watford Station. One no thing we, we didn't actually right discuss there. in the podcast, I wasn't in the um, friend special, I wasn't actually a big believer in eating or drinking on the bike. I never used to drink. I was a bit like Pantani. Um, pa- I, was, I was a bit like <laughs> Pantani. Um, Pantani, I can't remember which one of his teammates, I think it might have been Fabio Fontanelli, used to call him the camel. He never he never really drunk much when he was... Well, um, we can get on to unlike, that Unlike you, two. Richard. It's something you're never when, really accused when, of not we, drinking very we, much. <laughs> when we do that and when we do part two, we can cover that. But um, lots of fascinating stuff in there. I'm sure people will enjoy it. That was me interviewing Daniel, um, first in a series um, of us being interviewed by um, others. Uh, and Lionel, you've still to be interrogated as well. Yeah, put, put, putting, putting, that off, that, putting that off. Putting that off. Putting that off. Really? You want to do that in person, don't you, really? I, if you say so. Who's, <laughs> Listen, Daniel, sorry. Um, who's can the, we, who's can the we go frost back? To, who's the frost to Napalm's Nixon in that episode? Is that going to be me? <laughs> 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 uh, well, you can do it if you want, Daniel. Yeah, that would be great. Um, excellent. Good luck. Uh, going back to our Giro, 
uh, which you've been busy on, Daniel. The, the route is being revealed this week. Can you tell us, I mean, how did you set about that? We obviously had a route for the Giro this year starting in Budapest. Um, how much have you taken of the original route and how much have you added little flourishes of your well, own? I, w- I wanted to retain the spirit and most of the template of the original route. Um, it was, this was obviously a very fun exercise. I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Um, it was, I, I think we discussed, didn't we, the kind of thing that you would do at the back of the classroom um, when you were 14 or 15. You should have been concentrating on Latin. I mean, for me, it was sort of designing golf courses on a on a little notepad or football jerseys. Um, I think Napalm, you, des- you designed, in fact, uh, cycling oh, well, routes, did you? Yeah, I used to design my own Tour de France routes um, and, and actual, uh, well, the Tour de Kings Langley, which um, only one edition ever held, uh, featured the infamous sex shop time trial. So yeah, I think these were quite. Um, I should point out, I didn't call it that. That was some. That was uh, the name given it by uh, Simon, the photographer, who was the the only other rider in the event. Only two riders started the Tour de Kings Langley, um, and one finished. And no, well, we both finished. We both finished. <laughs> so anyway, Rich, um, getting back to the get, getting back to our route, and um, much like Napalm. I was very ably assisted. Um, I had a, a bit of a wingman, and that was Ben Lowe of Velo Viewer. <laughs> now, Velo Viewer, um, if you're not familiar with with well with Ben and Velo Viewer, um, they are the mapping service that I've really been working very very closely with world tour teams. The majority of world tour teams now, I think, use Velo Viewer over the last few years. And using Velo Viewer is really like pulling the curtain back on how World Tour teams plan races, um, how they wreck a routes, the kind of information they look to harvest from their route recces and their kind of you know preparation they do on things like um, Google Earth. So. You know, Ben's someone we've known for a few years now. When we we thought we were um, we might set about designing our own Jira route or or simulated Jira route, Ben was an obvious person to help us. And um, well, I think we can hear from him now, Rich. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about Vela Viewer and a little bit about the process of um, working with a, a heavyweight of um, of Grand Tour route design like yours truly. So Velvet is basically just a website which is used by both the professional teams and by many, many recreational cyclists. And uh, it helps them to get the most out of their riding by uh, enabling them to look at their Strava data in lots of interesting ways. So uh, I started back in about 2012 and I was just working uh, as, as a developer and I built Velvet because I just wanted to see the list of all the Strava segments I'd done. So I had no idea how many top 10s or top 50s I had. So it was purely around building that list and just seeing what I could do with the Strava data. And then other people started using the site, discovered it, and um, and I just kept on adding more and more features, uh, things like data visualizations and charts and graphs that just to display all your Strava data in lots of different ways. And then um, doing the 3D profiles was really interesting and, and th- those are like key to, to what the teams use and, and currently it's, they're being used by Eurosport and GCN for the, uh, the Zwift races that's going on at the moment. It's really good that it motivates people to to get out and and ride more. That's kind of one of the key things. And I really wanted to motivate people based on non-performance based targets, so not to do with speed or power. So things like Eddington numbers, and it's uh, it's basically how many times you've ridden a certain distance. So if you've ridden a hundred miles one hundred times, but you've not ridden a hundred and one miles a hundred and one times, then your Eddington number is one hundred. So you've built that one hundred miles. But then I've got various different ones, so like based on climbing and based on kilometers for people, because it'd be easier to get high adding to number in kilometers than it is in miles. Um, so yeah, that's basically what adding to numbers are for, for the maths geeks. So it looks like yours has got just over, it's got 50,008 meters of climbing. So I correct the elevation data for the for the team. So you, you, you've you got the access, same access as, as the team. So you have corrected elevation data in here. So yeah, just over 50,000 meters of climbing. Um, so the Tour de France for 20, the originally planned Tour de France of 2020 is, is uh, 55,000 metres of climbing. So, it's you know, it's touch soft on the overall climbing um, distance as well is three and a half thousand kilometres. So that's pr- pretty standard, really. But you uh, you definitely have some pretty hard stages in there. And uh, 
yeah, some 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 horrible looking finishes. So for every single stage, we've got the the route details page for it. Um, so the the way I, I process all all the all the the race routes for the whole season, but in, including your our Giro, um, is that they get mapped out as Strava routes, um, and the 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 teams get to uh, p- plan for, for races like the Tour de France as well, using that same page, which which you you the normal users will be able to access as well. Um, they just get a few extra features in there, which aren't really relevant to uh, to us normal folk. Um, so yeah, basically you can go in there and look at the 3D profiles, look at the work out where all the climbs are going to be. Um, we're, we're, we're lucky in, in terms of the, the Argyra that we don't have to ride the whole stage. So, uh, it'll just be certain sections. So, so we'll also have the segments available for those as well. So we'll be able to see exactly what it is you're doing each day. It is a challenge. Yeah. There's lots of red. So people who know my profiles if it's red that means it's very steep and there are certainly a few stages on there which have got some horrible looking red bits um there's there's it's fortunately not until stage nine so and that's just before the rest day so at least you get a little bit of chance to recover after that so basically i've, I've managed to keep it going just on my own so doing all the coding and all the all the admin stuff and making all the coffees everything like that um but i am hoping to recruit my first developer at some point over the summer if everything goes well um so no it's just been it's been a, a great journey and i've had over four hundred thousand strava users now connect their accounts to to Bellevue, so it's just crazy how it's how it's grown so chavs that was that was ben and um it's been great fun working with him over the last few weeks on this i must stress that if you are a bit of a nerd uh and you're a cyclist or even a runner or even a kayaker or canoer um you can as ben said there sign up canoeist for canoeist um, canoe pilot I don't know um, cycler a cycler yeah um, you can sign up as Ben said there to Velo Viewer Pro and it gives you a vast amount of absolutely fascinating detail you can lose yourself in that for um, many hours days weeks and months um, every possible um, metric and, and piece of information you could possibly imagine um, about your own uh, route planning, your own performance, um, you will find there. And at £10 uh, a year, it is really extraordinary value. So, um, yeah, we'll be we'll be talking a lot more about the route over the course of the three weeks. There are, there are mythical, legendary climbs, and I've sent the route over. There are also rich um, nods to the, the current situation in Italy. There are sort of homages to places we've talked about a lot over the last few weeks. Um, like Bergamo, um, which has been very badly hit by the coronavirus crisis. There are locations that relate very much to our history, our story, the cycling podcast over the last few years in the Giro. We're going to revisit some places where we've had fun and games over the last few years. And we can ride sections of our Giro as well, can't we? We're we're going to be saddling up, or at least Richard and I are. Um, You're not going to be riding are you daniel you're going to be well, you're going to be bike. head out of the sunroof in yeah. the race director's car shouting at the crowds to get back and uh... i'd like to see a graphic of that on the uh, <laughs> on the ride that we'll be doing because we're using the the rgt platform which is free to sign up to and there'll be segments from each of our stages available for people to ride starting with the prologue in budapest on saturday is that right daniel the will richard and the stages each stage will be available for three days um so you can you can ride it at your leisure um when it suits um for three days and um it starts with the prologue on saturday um the prologue is actually identical to what would have been the giro prologue in budapest and over the the 21 stages well there are 21 segments um so really it's the first grand tour of the season it's the only grand tour really in cycling taking place in cycling at the moment and our listeners can can finish that grand tour um the, the stages are about or well, the segments are between 25 and, and 40 kilometers a day um some huge climbs in there you'll be going over climbs like the fedaya the agnello and we'd, we'd really like to see um at least some listeners complete the route well, wouldn't we, we complete the yeah. segments i don't i don't expect someone to ride 3500 kilometers no, with i don't know how many that's not 50 000 meters of altitude going to be possible but we'd love to hear from people riding and we will uh, 
we're going to get to grips with this as, as we, we, we go on and, and there will perhaps be opportunities to organise group rides and have races and so on uh, as we as we go on. So we'll 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 share our experiences of riding it with you um, on the uh, in the daily episodes. Yeah, um, and if you haven't signed up to RGT Cycling's platform, we'll put all the details of how you can sign up to the platform on our website, thecyclingpodcast.com slash our Giro. And, uh, well, basically you download the apps for your computer and your phone and away you go. And, uh, yeah, well, I'll be riding. I'm not sure. I'm going to set out to try and complete the Giro, but... Um, you know, I'll probably fall a few days behind and then give up before the mountains. So, um, you know, I, I'm not setting the not setting the bar too high, but I'm I'm going to try. I'm, I promise to try to try to complete the Giro. I mean, one of the best things about it, Napalm, is you don't have to be leading general classification or general scoreboard, as we sometimes refer to it now, to wear the pink jersey. There is a cycling pod we have designed with our GT a, a cycling podcast. Our Giro pink jersey, haven't we? And you can wear that on the um, on the rides on the digital platform. Yeah, should just reassure people who perhaps aren't as enamoured with e-cycling or virtual cycling. Uh, we're not going to be reporting on these stages. That isn't what our Giro is about. Our Giro, the the podcast itself, is really uh, our regular Giro coverage, a kind of an amalgamation of the stage the daily stage episodes and kilometer zero all all put together the only thing missing is is the actual live racing we're going to be delving into the the history and culture of the race and of italy itself so we're not we're not going to be um talking about how richard got dropped on uh, stelvio in uh, in our giro our virtual giro we're well, not too much anyway i mean you know if i do manage to drop richard you won't hear the end of it of course not, not even listening <laughs> I'm listening. Uh, I think well, whoever sets the best time in the in the opening time trial in Budapest. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, yeah, yeah I need to Google how how to cheat at indoor cycling. <laughs> hey guys, it's uh, Monday, May fourth. You're listening to Lockdown with Larry. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so can't say a whole lot exciting happened this week. Uh, Just, yeah, I guess I finished up a rest week last week and then got back to training again this week. So right now it's just kind of like, you know, going through the motions. Uh, Pretty happy to see that a lot of my colleagues and friends in Europe are able to get back out on the roads again either this week or next week for the guys in France so I'm um, really happy for them because that's a long time uh, inside and you know definitely tough on the head so I think that will you know do them do them well um, but I do have an exciting announcement to make and that's that uh so yeah uh, I guess most of you are probably familiar with the no-go tour that Connor Dunn and I did a couple years ago. And, you know, I think there was a second podcast episode on it as well with uh, Connor's audio diary. Um, Well, actually, the whole week we had um, filmed a lot of stuff along the way. Connor had a GoPro and, uh, yeah, we kind of filmed our adventure and, you know, had considered putting together a video at the end. Uh, And Connor actually did, but... You know, we thought like, oh, maybe it would be cool to do something more with it than just, you know, a little video that we put together ourselves. So um, at the same time, the Cycling Podcast actually was considering getting into other forms of media uh, aside from just audio and podcasts. So um, it was a perfect match. And uh yeah, they asked us if we would be interested in being the first um, first video uh, that they did, so or movie. So, yeah, they <clears throat> sent a great team out, um, La Pedal CC, I believe is the name. Um, so Phil Sheehan and Rose Manley, and they came out, did some interviews with us in Nice, and uh, you know, filmed us riding and riding together a bit. 
and yeah, put together a pretty sweet movie, which I believe this coming week will be open to um, friends of the podcast uh, and potentially in the future to others for a small price. So uh, yeah, I think uh, I've already seen some preliminary parts of it and I'm pretty excited about it. So, you know, I think uh, it's kind of a fitting fitting experience or movie uh, to watch at this time because it's all about sort of uh, rediscovering, you know, your freedom and everything like that. And so um, with the imminent um, deconfinement in many countries, uh, I think a lot of people will really get to enjoy that, uh, you know, that time outside and that freedom on their bikes once again. So uh, I hope uh, you guys will, yeah, get to get to see it and uh, enjoy. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it. And yeah, I hope you guys really like it. So um, that will be coming soon. Beyond that, um, yeah, just that's pretty much the most exciting thing that's going to happen in a long time for me. So <laughs> just been eating well. Uh, my mom's been cooking a lot, delicious food, sometimes too good. Uh, so yeah, I actually, I started the diet again to get back in shape, uh, this week. So, um, training has been going really well, but I have been indulging slightly more than usual. So, uh, this last week it's been, been back on, back on the straight and narrow in terms of, uh, food. So, That'll probably be a few week process, but uh, not too bad when uh, you're training hard. So um, we'll be watching the cookies uh, and stuff like that. Uh, not too many peanut M and M's anymore, uh, and yeah, just uh, enjoying in a less liberal fashion. So cool. Well, hope you guys uh, are holding up well and. Uh, for those who are still stuck inside, I hope uh, you have a great time out on the road this next week. So you deserve deserve uh, to get back out there. Talk to you all soon. Well, that was Larry Warbass there with his weekly dispatch from lockdown. And, uh, well, he mentioned the film there that we have been working on for quite some time, uh, And So We Road, which uh, is a, a, a documentary, 40 minutes long, about Larry and Connor Dunn's uh, no go tour, which they called it when they their team Aqua Blue went bust during the 2018 season, uh, just before the Tour of Britain, and their response to that was just take off on their own adventure, and uh, well they returned with quite a lot of footage which has never been seen before, and we've we've made it into a a, a documentary with some interviews with the the two of them as well, and that's going to be released exclusively for the moment for friends of the podcast. The first time we've ever offered Friends of the Podcast uh, a video. And, they'll, and Friends of the Podcast will be able to watch it for a month um, from May the 11th, which is next Monday. And that will coincide with day three of our Giro. Um, if you sign up as a friend for the next month after that, you'll be able to watch it. If you're already a friend of the podcast, you'll be able to watch it. You'll get instructions about how to watch it. Um, but yes, a little treat for friends of podcast. We'll be we'll be virtually flying back from flying from Hungary to Sicily that day, so we can virtually watch it on the virtual plane. We can, we can. Well, l- um, let's just remind listeners how this actually came about, because if you recall, the Aqua Blue team was supposed to be riding the Tour of Britain, weren't they? And we'd asked Connor Dunn to keep an audio diary from the Tour of Britain, and of course, the team went pop before the race and um so when connor and larry set off on their bikepacking adventure we asked them to keep an audio diary anyway which was released for friends of the podcast and once the giro once our giro is over we will put that episode on our uh, regular feed so uh, it will be a bit of a companion piece to the film so well everyone will get a chance to listen to the original um, audio story of their journey and well the film will be out as you say Richard on Monday for Friends of the Podcast and they'll be able to watch it for a month and anybody who signs up over the next month will also be able to watch it so if you fancy uh, 40 minutes of escapism in the Alps and um, you know following the two of them on their adventure it's it's well at the moment in particular 
you watch it with a certain amount of nostalgia and you know looking forward to being able to explore roads like that again in the not too distant future um well listen we've got lots to look forward to with our giro starting in budapest on saturday um and i mean stay tuned it'll be nightly episodes for the 21 days of our giro no rest days for us no i'd better get cracking on a goulash we're going to play out with Francois Tomaso's song, Looking Ahead to Our Giro. Um, but before we do, a few thanks to friends of the podcast. Uh, thank you very much indeed to Phil Chiquano, Mark Wilder, David Tomlinson, Brzezemek Kowalkowski, Lars Thomas Holter, Mark Florence, Brad Duff, Lucy Holden, Greg Lowe, Hector Heathcote and James Bishop. And a big thank you to Paul Barber, Anthony Ornett, Ewan Lawson, Kieran Finnegan, Toby Hopkins, John Ellis, William Nicholl, Kevin Mitz, George Sendall and Keith Robertson. And a big thank you as well to Jacob Matthews, John Locke, Christopher Murray, David Gilchrist, Richard Watt, Peter Fry, Bryn Wilding, Keith Engelker, Kevin Baxter. Well, guys, um, this is François Tomaso, and I'm locked uh, down. Well, p- probably not for long. Uh, it's a week before we get locked out in France normally. Anyway, I wanted to. I know there are all most of you, all of you probably uh, have been locked down in your in your house, in your flat for uh, the best part of the of the last month or also. And um, well, lots of you have been practicing training in your room. And, um, well, I wanted to pay homage to, to the place where we spent most of our days recently. And uh, here is a song by the Beach Boys. There is a world where I can go and tell my secrets to in my room. Training laugh at yesterday. Now it's dark and I'm alone, but I won't be afraid. 